When a pastor hasn't preached in a couple of weeks, you have to wrestle the microphone from him. Thought I was going to have to take it away. He's ready, and he will. He will. Yeah, it'll be tough in a couple of weeks for him to stop. Before I get started this morning, I wanted to share something God reminded me of this morning, and he almost put it in the sermon, and I decided not to, and I went back and forth. Uh, but y'all get those things all the time where, you know, on Facebook, and you say, what's wrong with this picture? You know, and you have to pick out what's wrong with this picture. And I feel like we have, uh, as a people, as a country, even as Christians, have become people that are good at picking out what's wrong with something. And uh, I don't, I'm not going to preach it, but we need to get out of that habit. And God's challenged me to, to a different game, and that's what's right with it. What's right with my church? What's right with my spouse? What's right with my country? So I want to challenge you just for a second. Think about what's right before you say what's wrong. Let's think about what's right. Now, that's not going to be uh, an easy process because we've kind of pushed ourselves the other way. It's a habit. It is a habit, just finding what's wrong and saying what's wrong. There is no money in telling you what's right with things. There is no advertisers that want to hear what's right with something. They only want to hear what's wrong. All right, so welcome to 2022. I may be the first sermon for some of you, and some of you uh, may have already listened to four or five sermons this year, and I will be one of the top ten then. Now, many of you are glad to see 2021 go. Uh, A lot of us are. And, you know, everybody seizes on that opportunity to make some money. So I don't know if you all saw Bath and Body Works has put out a scented candle for 2021. I stole that from, I think it was Tracy on Facebook. But didn't it feel that way sometimes? It feels that way. I want to read you a real story. This is not a joke. This is a real story. I I checked it three or four times just to make sure that what this guy said was true. It says, two men who spent 29 days lost at sea in the South Pacific, were rescued 280 miles from their point of origin earlier this month, September. Levey and Junior climbed in their small 60-horsepower boat on September 3rd and departed from a western province in the Solomon Islands. They were headed for the town of Noro on New Georgia Island, which was 200 kilometers away. Bad weather got them. They were sent in the opposite direction. Levey said... It was heavy rain, thick, dark clouds, strong winds. Without seeing any island, we decided to stop the engine and stay afloat and save a little bit of fuel. So for the first nine days, the men sustained on oranges they had packed. So they had oranges. Then for 20 days that followed, they lived off coconuts. Anytime they saw coconuts floating, they would start the engine, go to the coconuts, cut them open with the anchor, and just live a couple of more days. They got some canvas to get some rainwater for drinking water and followed the direction of the wind. After 29 days adrift, LeVay and Junior spotted a fisherman off the coast of Papua New Guinea. They were brought ashore. They were too weak to walk. They carried them into the town of Pomeo on October 2nd, and they were recovering. They told reporters... They described the event of being stranded as scary. However, Live also suggested that his and Junior's month at sea was, if nothing else, a nice break from the daily reality of a global pandemic and a good way to get away from it all. I shared that with you because what we have is not a United States problem. And I'm talking about the pandemic. I'm talking about we're being bombarded. Yes, COVID exists. Yes, all these things exist. But we're being bombarded with constant, whatever it is, whatever you follow is after your attention. It's always after you. And because of this, it it causes us to live in a shallow place in our heart. We can't go deeper because we're always scrolling, swapping, turning the page. I watch football. I I love football. I've watched a lot of college football this last week. I root for teams that I don't really know much about. But I was watching uh, Oklahoma State, and they were behind 28-7 to yesterday. 
And Oklahoma State is known for their hurry-up offense. And the hurry-up offense, they started, man, play, play, play. Ten seconds, ten seconds, ten seconds. And they ran it, and they went, and they went. And they went from their biggest uh, deficit that they overcome in school history, 21 points, and they came back and won. Because the hurry-up offense is about running another play before the defense can substitute or get ready for that play. But isn't that where I live? Swap, 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 swap. The enemy sends something else. There's some more bad news. Here comes something else, another negative thing or another positive thing. It just keeps coming, keeps coming. And I find myself that I'm, I'm rattled. I'm always on this. I'm too easily irritated with, with other people, with situations that I shouldn't be so irritated with. And of course, when I'm rattled, I want to eat something that's fried. Or it's got a lot of sugar in it. Because that's what we do. So we have accepted slightly rattled as a normal state of life. Now when we're in that state, we believe that we can violate some principles. Now some rules, some laws, you know you can't. You know you can't trick. If I take this water and, and I dump out a little water, what direction is it going? You're right. Good job. All of you know that. But take a law like the law of exposure. Now, we think of exposure with sun. But whatever you expose yourself to gets in your head. It's as true as the law of gravity. When we expose ourselves to eight hours of people yelling on TV because they're angry about whatever they're angry about, they're scared. It affects us. The music that's filled with actions and attitudes and words that are contrary to God's word, it affects us. There's men that look at pornography and women that look at pornography. And they, oh, it's not going to affect me. It's not going to affect me. We almost look as if we put on a little bit of God in the morning like sunscreen. I put on my 15 minutes of God. The world's not going to get me. But that's not the way it is. Even an hour of God. You put 12 hours of the world, it's going to get you. So we have to take a break from this world. And that's one of the things. These, these three points that I'm going to give you, it's about me. I've got to take a break. I've got to get away. I, I've been watching the, the Chosen. If you haven't watched The Chosen, whoo, that's some good TV, isn't it? That Chosen is something else. But you see Jesus get up early in the morning, and he goes out. And the, the disciples are like, well, where are we going? Ah, I'm not going with well, can I come with you? No. No, I need some time away. I need to go be with my heavenly father. So he gets up and he leaves and he, he hides away. Now, if Jesus needed to do that, Steve needs to do that. I need a break. And there's, there's a simple thing that I do. I started this about six months ago. I was reading a book, and the book was about getting your life back. And he called it Pause. There's actually an app that he has for the pause. He has a one-minute, a three-minute, a five-minute, a ten-minute pause. But in the pause, he says, I just want you to say one thing. I give everyone and everything to you, God. I give everyone and everything to you, God. And then it goes a little further. He says, I need more of you. Jesus, restore my, restore my soul, restore my connection. But we have to take a pause. We have to, to take a break. You know what? If I don't create space for God in my life, he's not going to come jumping on top of me, screaming and yelling and forcing space. I have to create the space for him to fill. You have to create space in your life for him to fill. You know what? He could get your attention. You do not want that. You do not want him to get... How many people have you heard that said, well, God got my attention. I was in bed for six months. My back, my leg... My surgery, you don't want that. Now, we preach this, every pastor preaches this, that we treat our souls like a junk drawer. Anybody have a junk drawer at home? Oh, come on. I know you people. You have a junk drawer at home, and we just kind of shove everything in it. Uh, I've got to clear the counter. So we put it in there. But we need to detach from the junk. My wife cleaned out the junk drawer. Six screwdrivers. No, no, no. 
Not one flathead. I could never find a flathead. They were all Phillips. Who needs six Phillips screwdrivers? But isn't that the way in your life that we keep putting in? Who needs, who needs anger at this? Who needs resentment at this? Who needs unforgiveness here? And we just keep dropping junk in, junk in, junk in. And before you know it, you have a lot of junk in your life. Now we know Matthew, and Matthew, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary, I will give you rest. Uh, an even better verse is 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now that's the same thing as Jesus. I give everyone and everything to you. I give all my anxiety, all my worry, all my stress. Because you, even though you're good, you cannot care about everyone and everything. Did you know 20 years ago we didn't have to care about COVID in another country? Because we didn't know about the other country. We know about every country and every problem. Everything that's bad in the world, I hear about. And I cannot carry it. I can't carry the weight of my spouse, my job, my kids. I don't have grandkids yet, but I hear you carry those too. My health. And still care about the pandemic, vaccines, the economy. Some of you care about the elections that are 10 months away. And some of you are worried about the election that's 34 months away. Be honest. You're already thinking about 2024. We can't do that. I give everyone and I give everything to you, God. Say it with me. Say, I give everyone and everything to you, God. Let's say it one more time. I give everyone and everything to you, God. Now, here's the thing. God knows you're going to pick it back up in a little bit. You know you're going to pick it back up in a little bit. Because as humans, we want to control the outcome of everything. We just, you know what, you can't. You can't do it. I've known men that have eaten nothing bad for them for 50 years of their life, have exercised every day, and died at 50. You can't control the outcome. You can't control the other driver. You can't control the world. All you're doing is giving it to him. And you know what? He's already got it anyway. You giving it to him does not burden him. It unburdens you. He doesn't have to add things. When I, I see pastor on Tuesday, we sit down most weeks and I say, is there anything that you need me to do? And he takes his list out and he gives me a couple of things. And you know what he thinks? I watch you take a pen and he goes, scratch. He took it off of his list and put it on mine. Hey, that's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. But do you know, when you take something off of your list and give it to God, could you imagine God? He's up there like, all right, Steve said he's not going to spend any time and emotional energy on the elections. I guess I'm going to have to now. That's not the way God thinks. See, I, I have to spend, as a responsible citizen in this country, between 30 minutes and an hour, to vote in November. I do not have to spend 200 hours angry or 300 hours angry and worried about what's going to happen. I do not have to do that. That's not what I'm supposed to be doing in this world. But sometimes we prefer the distraction. The more distracted we are, the less empty we are, the less we feel bored. You know what? Boredom's okay. I tell my kids this, and they're like, what? I'm like, it's okay. They say, I'm bored. I'm like, good. Good job. Oh, no, I can't handle it. I, I, I can't be bored. But you need to be bored. You need to deal with the needs, the disappointments, the hurts that are inside you. You need to deal with the fears inside you. We're so entangled and meshed. I was up in the sound booth today, and there's a, I started to bring it down because there's a pile of wire sitting on a chair, and it is so tangled up. It is, I mean, it is unbelievable, the mess. And it's something from 15 years ago that everybody looks at and goes, ah, if we ever need one, we'll get it out of there. But I'm not untangling that mess. But that's how my spirit feels. I'm, I'm tangled up. Now, some of you are thinking now, Steve, you can't do that because I've got to love others. I've got to care for others. I can't just, I can't just let things go. Well, you can because you're not God. 
you're not. Most of you know this. You're not God. But some of you are a little confused. You can't save the world, much less carry it. Jesus says in Luke 12, can all your worries... I always hated this scripture. Now that I'm older, I really hate it. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? No. And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over big, bigger things? Did you know they have done studies, as you knew they would, on social media use? And they directly, I mean directly correlate. You use more social media, you have more depression and anxiety. Period. Oh, but I don't look at bad things. Doesn't matter. You use more social media, you have more depression and anxiety. Do you need to hear something else? Do I, I'm not saying never follow, never look. I'm saying don't get caught scrolling, scrolling. Facebook's this way, Instagram's this way. Don't get caught scrolling. And our attention span starts to deteriorate. Now, I know some of you right now going, I know. Come on. You've been preaching 14 minutes. 14's all I got. But again, more studies. PhDs. Now, PhDs, to get a PhD, you have to read and read and read and read and read. Write a little bit. Read, read, read. They've read tens of thousands of pages. But now PhDs, when they ask them, they're saying, we can't pay attention more than five minutes. We can't read a book. We can barely read an article. We've read all of our lives, but the technology has caused us to swap, swap, swap. And we, we can't even sit still. It also affects your Ability to think deep, which leads to prayer, empathy, compassion. We can't concentrate on a, on a task. I, I look at, my kids are great. My kids, uh, my kids are the top. They're just wonderful kids, but they still can't focus. They just got a few minutes. They just got a few minutes and they need to move, be moving on. They got to, they got to, and here's the point. You need to move on no matter how good what you're looking at is. That's scary. That's scary. Whether you're with God and you're having a wonderful prayer time, you feel the need to go look at something. You're reading in the Bible and it is amazing. But I need to look at my phone. No matter how good something is, we're still needing to move on. And that's dangerous. So the first thing I need to do, first thing we need to do this year, is to take a break. We've got to take a break from the world. We've got to get rid of this distraction. Psalm 1, right there at the beginning, David talks about uh, being able to meditate on his law day and night. I know what you're thinking. David didn't have a uh, social media. He, he could do that. So can you. But it's going to take practice. It's going to take work. And he says if you meditate on the law day and night, you're like a tree planted by the water, brings it forth fruit in due season. If you don't, you're blown away because you have no roots. We've got to find that. We've got to get that. The second thing, and Pastor Chris wanted to step on this point today, we've got to recognize the presence of God. We've got to realize He's here. He's here. And He wants to be with us. You don't have to pray for God's presence. Because if you're a Christian, He's there. You have to recognize His presence. Now, I love Psalm 23. I really do. I know that's, that's what you learn when you're a kid. But, but I, I, probably, I couldn't tell you how many hundreds of times I quote that in a year. At night, when I wake up, I meditate. I love Psalm 23. And I've wanted to preach it, and God's never let me preach it. And I'm not even going to have time to today. But I want to give you a couple of things out of it. I want to first look at, there's two sides. Our part and God's part. So here's our part of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, all that. Our part is I want for nothing. I don't need anything. He makes me lie down so I get to rest. I'm led to a good source of something to drink, to water. I'm refreshed and stored. He does the restoring. I am guided along the right paths. Now, we do walk through the valley, but I don't fear because he's with me. I am comforted. 
A table is prepared before me. I'm anointed. My cup overflows. And goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But the better part is the shepherd. The presence of the shepherd. He's there for every step. He makes you lie down. He leads you. He guides you. He restores your soul. Even when we walk through the valley, the shadow of death, He's with us. His rod and His staff are there to comfort us. He prepares a table. He anoints our head. He fills our cup. Now, He takes us to quiet waters. And, and it's funny, I've heard, I was telling Pastor Chris, I've heard two different pastors preach this in the last six months. And uh, they both have different reasons why Jesus takes us to quiet waters. And it's the opposite. It cracked me up. I'm like, I mean, I guess they could kind of be true, but they, I'm not going to use either one. But I just found it. everybody wants to preach it. So why quiet waters? Well, let me ask you this. What's a sheep made of? He wears wool all over him. If you soak wool in water, is that a good thing? Sheep can't get out of rushing waters. So Jesus takes you to quiet waters because he knows if you get too much on you, you can't get out. Now, I'm talking again about media. I'm talking about too much on you. Remember, we're talking about getting a break and untangling. Too much on you. So, so Jesus says, no, Steve, we, we aren't drinking here. There's too, too much danger here. Come over here where it's nice and easy. Take a little drink here. Enjoy it here. It's slow. It's safe. He's protecting us again. But we have lost the plot. Now, that's a new term to me, lost the plot. I was listening to a guy. Uh, they're, they're British. Uh, and it, if, I, if you've done the Right Now Media series on prayer, Pete Grieg, he's one of the guys that's behind this devotional thing. But he says, lost the plot. And I heard it about four months ago, and I rewound it. I said, what did he say? What did he say? And I looked it up. And they used this term. And what it means is we're in a story. And we're trying to follow along. But we lose the plot in the story. And all of a sudden, we're following things that aren't the real story. We're following meaningless details. And we lose the plot of the story. Now, we think the story this year is midterm elections. We think the story this year is can we beat the pandemic? Will inflation keep rising? But the plot goes back, what's that, 6,000 years to when God created the world, a world for us, and then we didn't love him, right? We didn't do a good job of that. So he sent his son to redeem us, and that son is the shepherd in Psalm 23. Jesus knew about Psalm 23 in John 10. He says, I am that shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the voice. I'm the one that you follow. But 2,000 years later, from Jesus' time, the plot is still going on. And what's your role? See, we can't get lost in the detail, lost in the story. Don't you hate watching a TV show with somebody that's not paying attention and they keep asking you the plot? Who's that person? Just watch. I'll rewind it. We'll watch it again. No, just tell me. No. I want us to pay attention to the plot. See, I'm worried that whenever it comes to my part, it's going to read something like, well, Steve worried a lot. <laughs> he was technically in ministry, but he did okay at loving, loving families. Uh, but he sure was stressed a lot. And he seemed really concerned with managing the outcomes of things instead of focusing on the real plot. Now, if I'd written the 23rd Psalm, it would probably read a little bit different. I'd change a few things, probably more, you know, I'd be a little more heroic in it. <laughs> I wouldn't just lay down. <laughs> Seems like I'm laying down a lot and following a lot. I'm not leading much. Of course, there'd be no valleys if I wrote it. We'd live on the mountaintop. But one particular part bothers me. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. See, my version would say, you slaughter my enemies, we cook them. 
And then we have a good meal laughing about how you killed them. But that's not what he wrote. Now, I would rather have a table at the beach. I like ambiance. I don't want you to put me by the kitchen. I don't want you to put me by the bathrooms. I want the good booth. But that's not what he did. He says, God, God says, let's eat here in the presence of your enemies. Right here. While they're watching you. While they're plotting to destroy you. And, and God, and here's Jesus. Now, understand, he's made a pretty good meal for you. I mean, if I went home today, back to Texas, my mom knows what I like. So you don't have to ask me. Jesus knows what you like. It's a pretty good meal. He's preparing a great table for you. He's giving you what you need. And he's saying, look at me. Look at me. Don't get so distracted. Focus right here. I don't worry about them. Don't look out here. Don't look at your enemies. Look at me. Focus right here. He wants you to pay attention to him. But here's what, you know, we're probably, some of you, now I don't do this. If you take pictures of your food, shame on you. Don't post those on social media. But if Jesus made you a meal, you would want to, well, let me get a picture of this first. I need to post this. And then you would probably say, Jesus, thank you. That, that looks great. Uh, but I'm a little busy right now. Uh, could you give me a to-go container and I'll, uh, I'll eat it later. I, I'll be fine with that. But that's not what we're supposed to do. Back to taking a break. We're supposed to pause and we're supposed to eat because he's prepared the table for us in the presence of our enemies. And what he, do, do, you think, do you think God, our good shepherd, ever says, all right, here's a table in the presence of you, let's sit down. Does he ever let your enemies sit down with you? Of course he wouldn't. But do you? We literally give the enemy a seat at our table. Now, now it happens really fast. It, have you ever been in a restaurant, ran into somebody right as you're about to sit down, and you went, I don't really want to have dinner with them. But of course they want to have dinner with me. And you can't say no. All of a sudden, just like that, they're there. And we've come with the enemy. It happens that fast. Because you know what? The enemy don't walk up and say, Hey, I was thinking about killing you. Would you mind if I sit down? No, the in Well, no. He comes and says, Yeah, you know what? I agree. You've been working really hard lately and nobody's appreciating you. He puts his arm around you. And he says, uh, You know, I, I understand. Your, your boss, your boss is a real jerk. I get that. And then before you know it, he's sitting at the table. Before you know it, you, you've given him a seat. And you just say, oh, that's just the way it is in the world. The enemy's present in everything. Anxiety is just a part of life. Worry is just the norm. You know, why wouldn't I be afraid? Have you seen what's going on? No, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to allow the enemy to have a voice in our life. And it just takes a moment. Just in a moment, he's sitting down, he's talking to you nice, but he's, he's getting ready. He's getting ready to pull out that 1 John 2.16. You know, the, the devil's toolkit, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He's getting ready to set a trap for you. He takes what you desire, what you fear, what you wish for, and he sets that trap. But he gains access to your mind that way. Now, of course, the enemy, here's the things we know I've already said, Try your best to not find the bad, but find the good in life. But the enemy is going to spend time saying, you know, let's worry about comparison. Do you see how much better they've got it than you? That's a, a definite attack. The other one that I'm hearing a lot is you're doomed. There's no way you'll ever escape from this. There's no way out. This is the end of the world. One that a, that a lot of you fight, and I have at times, is worthlessness. I, I'm no good. I'm, I'm not anyone. And the enemy just keeps feeding that. Yeah, you're right. Nobody cares about you. It's not you against the world. So I just want to review those things. I mean, now it's four. It was three when I started this sermon. But find good. Find good. The second thing is I'm going to take a break from being God this year. 
I am not going to even pretend that I'm in charge. I'm going to take a break from worry. And I'm going to create space in my life for Him. Then I'm going to recognize the presence of God. He's here. Today. In a couple of minutes, we're going to open up the altar. And He's here for you. He wants to do things for you. So we have to recognize whatever the valley, whatever the battle, whatever the test, He's there. And recognize and then acknowledge His presence. The third thing is I'm not going to give the enemy a seat at my table. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Every day He wants to be with me, the enemy. He wants to sneak in. But I'm not going to do that. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank You. Holy Spirit, that You're here. That You are present with us this moment. We stand right at the beginning of 2022. Right at the very first. And Lord, we would be, I would really miss an opportunity if I don't give people the opportunity to accept you. So right now, if no matter where you've lived in the past, no matter what you've done, no matter who you were, it's a new year, it's a new time. So if you would like to accept Jesus, if you would like to start this year and say, I want him, I want his presence in my life, and you haven't accepted him before, or you need to renew that commitment, raise your hand now. Raise your hand and let us know. Let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We see those, those hands. So let's pray this together. Father, I thank you. I understand you sent your son to die for me. I don't want to forget the plot of this story. Come into my life and save me. That's all it took. That's all it took. Right now, I want everybody to stand together. Everybody stand up. We're going to sing in just a moment. Our pastors and our uh, leaders are coming forward to pray with you in just a moment. But right now, I want you to think of those four things. Those four things in your life. And I want you to pick one of the four things. Remember, I point out bad things. I don't think about the good. I'm not good at taking a break. I think I'm God. I'm not good at recognizing the presence of God. And I give the enemy a seat at my table. Pick out one of those four things. And let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you. We worship you. That you care enough about us to send your son. That you care enough to be right here in the presence of my mess. And today, I'm giving it to you. I'm giving everyone and everything to you. I am not going to be negative anymore. I know I will a little bit, but I'm going to try to find the good in things, God. I'm going to try to find the good in things. Lord, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to let you be God for a while. I'm going to take a break from media. I'm going to take a break from all the junk in my world. And Lord, I'm going to recognize your presence. I'm going to recognize your presence. And then, Lord, finally, the enemy is no longer going to have a seat at my table. Our pastors are coming now. They're lining up here. If you have something you need to pray about, if you need, if you need healing, if you need to give something to God, whatever it is, today, come down. Come, pray with us today. Pray with us today.